Hello, this is Craig Mertens, Director of Product Education for Inktavo, the parent company of Graphics Flow, Inksoft, and Pintavo. We have two very special guests with us today. We have two of the founders of a very famous company in our industry now, Supercolor, Mike Modgill uh, and Rumwalia. And uh, Mike today is is actually joining us from New Zealand. So what time of the day is it over there? It's um, 7.30 in the morning. Holy, that that, that is a commitment. Let me tell you, I'm super the impressed. Starting. And then Rum is the world's traveler, so he's in Denver today. Yeah. Hey, happy to be here. Thank you for having so, us. Yeah, well, be be grateful you're not in Phoenix, Arizona. We've now on 11th of the day of 110 Fahrenheit, which I think is like about 45 Celsius in a row. So it's been a it's been a little bit toasty here. So we're all uh, we're all cooped up in our homes and praying that our air conditioning holds up. So um, I'm really excited to have both of you on. Um, I'm a huge fan of the both the product and the company. And it's really, it's kind of weird how I found out about you guys. And it was about, I think it was the summer of 2020 where we were all bored, locked in our homes. And this buddy of mine calls me up and he says, hey, what do you know about direct to film? And I was like, I know nothing about it. I never heard of it. And so I immediately went to YouTube and I stumbled across a video that one of your social influencers had done talking about your hybrid digital process, which really, just fascinated me. I'm like, I got to find out what this is all about. So I'm going to kind of dish out some questions to you. And the first one I want to ask is the fundamental one is how did you get started in this digital heat transfer business? And either one of you can answer or you guys can tag team on it if you'd like. So I'm a, I'm a, I'm a, a lifelong decorator. I, um, I started learning how to digitize, I think in 19, 1992 or something like that when I dropped out of university. Um, I pretty much have only worked in this industry and um, I've had a couple of companies along the way. I had a company called Embroidery Specialist where I had a partnership in and because I'm really unoriginal, not over that shoulder, I named my other next company Embroidery Works. Um, we embroidered, we screen printed and we made um, rudimentary heat transfers. Um, we used to travel a lot. Um, me and my other partner in Supercolor Bill, and we'd go overseas because in New Zealand there's not a lot of, I suppose, um, there's not a lot, there's not much of the industry here. And so if you wanted to learn about how to become a better decorator, you had to go and travel. And in one of those travels, I stumbled across a sort of like a full color process, a transfer process. And New Zealand's a very short run market. We print 20 units, and sometimes there might be five, six colors in it. and People, um, the adoption rates of dry fit garments and all that sort of thing was quite high here. We, um, on one of these travels, I brought back a whole lot of stuff to make what was Supercolor. We didn't know it then. This was in around about, so like 2014. And we couldn't get it to work, so I just threw all the stuff in the corner and forgot about it. And um, about a year later, um, Bill was in my shop and um, our other partner, Paul, who was my egg supplier, and... Um, we all had a little bit of a, a play around and we printed off some digital transfers and we screen printed the, the backs of them. And um, that was probably when the first Supercolor came um, along. And Bill left, took all the stuff and he came back and he had a perfect transfer that was in register. And I started buying it off him. Um, this was probably in 2015 and we had some other people in the industry that were um, in the local industry that were kind of interested in buying it off us as well and they sort of like approached us. My guy was in Australia and um, we sort of knew we had something because like it had been quite powerful for my business Embroidery Works when I started selling it. And um, we um, decided to set up Supercolor and that was February 2016 and there was four of us. We started making the transfer. In the early days um, we couldn't even get a transfer to wash. We were struggling with it wasn't made on the same digital presses that we use today. Um, and it took us about a year to work that out. And then we, me and Bill and um, our other two partners, we had a meeting one day and I said to them, I'd love to take it to America. I'd just come back from a, an ISS show. And um, they said, how are you going to do that? And I said, I don't know, let's, let's see if we can work it out. And um, we, um, I went traveling to LA and a mutual friend from China, told me to go and see these um, these two dudes that were that had a shop in um, Gardena, 
And I said, what have you been doing with them? And he says, oh, I've been, I've been working with one of them, Marcello, and I've been telling him about what you've been doing, and I've been trying to get him up, into, up to speed. And I'm like, oh, man, are you going to teach everybody everything before I get there? Hey. And uh, <laughs> he, he laughed, and he said, you should go and see these guys. And so um, I went to America for about 12 days. I didn't really – I knew a couple of people, um, and um, I went to a rum shop and Gardena. And I sat there and I had a look around and I looked at what they were doing and they were sort of printing transfers and they were doing, um, this is now the, the old deco press shop. Well, this is what there's now deco press and they were doing lots of patches and twill patches and all that sort of thing. And I thought, man, these guys have really got some nice products here. And, um, that week I kept going back. I just kept stalking them and, um, hanging out and I'm sure they were wondering what I was doing there, but. I didn't really know anybody else in America, so I had to, I had to sort of, and and I just, I was just watching all that sort of thing, and then I left, and a couple of weeks later, um, I came back and said to these guys, I said, "Let's bring Supercolor to America," and hey, no. um, we did. That was, <clears throat> we um, started in America in 2019. Um, we got off to an interesting start. The first year was wasn't tough, wrong. It was, it was interesting like we got to our break even point pretty quickly which was kind of nice um we didn't really we were sort of hovering around that <clears throat> we were using a traditional sales model like we were just going out and seeing people and we were we we weren't being digital about it or anything like that and um we just um me and Rom used to go to cold calling we'd sit in the rental car and we'd I remember one trip we went to san jose and rom has got his phone out and we're just looking for people and we're dropping them off price catalogs and samples and all that sort of thing we cruised around sort of probably, I don't know, five screen printers that day. Um, we hadn't necessarily thought about the power of the product past the branding companies. Like it was a screen printers product and the way we sold it was to help screen printers make more money because it would take the, the complex jobs off their screen printing machines, especially if there was low units or if the fabric was technical. Absolutely. That was, that was sort of like our, that was our MO. Um, and then the, the pandemic hit. <laughs> We'd, um, we'd also at this point just opened up the UK branch in um, February 2019. And Hold on. You launched a business in the middle of a pandemic. Am I, am I hearing this correctly? Yeah, we did. We, we had a month's trading before they shut us down. Wow. And uh, <laughs> that was, we'd been selling tractors up there for a little while. We've been making them in LA. But, um, you know, all the machinery sort of arrived in February 2020 or 2019. 2020? 2020. And, um, so we were at work for a month and then it shut down. And at this point, I made a lot of promises to a lot of people and I borrowed a lot of money. And I was sweating quite hard, wondering what the, the world was going to bring us. And um, and it was interesting. Rum sent me an email one day and he said, this, um, this, is, this, is, this is when we get going. And this is, this is when we should sort of dig in. And this is, this is where you find out sort of like, you know, who, who the people are you've got around you. And that pandemic year, we started... Um, our friend Stan made down um, a lot of content for us and we put up a lot of videos and then it just went viral. Um, we went from four employees once we did get back to work and um, we were doubling every two months. We air freighted in machinery. We, um, we air freighted in a, a line from Europe, which was a 40 foot and a 20 foot container. Wow. And then later on that year we had to buy another line and we had nowhere to put it because we were kind of landlocked and so rum and the guys had to remodel the factory whilst we were printing wow and so he was he was moving the screen room and he had diggers in there and there was dust and all this sort of shit and we still had to keep on printing which um and looking looking back right that that, that time in the business was just such an exciting time you know, like um, we had to work out how we we're going to support it from New Zealand because we couldn't travel because we were, our country was locked down. Right. And um, my wife had locked me down even more because she said, unless you get vaccinated, you can't go. So <laughs> I was sort of waiting for that to come around, which took its time. Um, but we we learned a lot. We learned a lot about sort of like making the transfer and growing and all that. And um, we just carried on growing. We opened up our Atlanta factory, I suppose, when was that run? 2021? Yeah, that's um, right. late 2021, um, which meant that we had sort of like both coasts covered. Um, 
around about the same time in the middle of 2021, we opened up our Hawthorne factory, which was probably our biggest facility. Um, we kept buying machines. We put more machines into New Zealand. The business kept growing. Um, we've nearly got 330 people worldwide now. Um, we don't make um, many different products. Like at the moment, like we pretty much only make our, our hybrid or our screen printer DTF, as we now call it, because the market's changed. Right. Um, and um, yeah, it's been a really interesting journey. And we've met so many fantastic people along the way, and we've helped so many people along the way. Um, we had to learn about, I suppose, what made us special and what we thought made us special. And it all came back down to the connections that we have with people and how we treat them. We, um, we say that we've got a, a shared DNA, if you like. We're not transfer manufacturers. We're decorators masquerading as transfer manufacturers. Oh, perfect. And, um, you know, like um, we've we've done everything that your customers have done. We've sold shirts. We've dealt with customers. We've had people come in and they want five of this, three of this, ten of this. They want individual names on the back, you know, and they want a bit of embroidery on it as well and all of that sort of thing. Like that That was that was pretty much my life for sort of like 20 years. So we, we, yeah. we know what it takes to run these businesses and one of the biggest privileges in my life, I suppose, has been when you spend a whole lot of time working in your own business and then you get to go out and you get to see everybody else's business. Yeah. You know, and so traveling around, leading these people, seeing their shops, listening to their stories, looking at their problems. It's so interesting. And um, there's some, um, yeah, it's a, it's a tough game. There's a lot of detail, lots of, lots of things that you've got to know. Um, but the one thing that all of these people are all of the time is they're always time poor. You know, it's busy. You're making stuff. You know, you're not, when somebody comes in and asks you to do something, you, you don't put it off a shelf. You've got to actually go out and you've got to work out how you're going to make it, how you're going to print it, how that customer's going to get the best result. And sometimes that's really challenging. Yeah, I, I agree. You know, I would <coughs> classify you as your company as the pioneers of this technology globally. And, one of the things that, um, you know, I was I, honestly, I was kind of skeptical when I first heard about the technology, I ordered a sample pack and we're accustomed to, two. um, I've got my, the color transfer from our trade show shirts and in, in the MBM show graphics, graphics pro show. Now they're calling it in, in Indianapolis. And I was skeptical. I was skeptical about the hand and I was skeptical, uh, skeptical about the wash durability. And, you know, I'd seen digital transfers on the market before and nothing really impressed me. And, you know, I think a lot of times folks were kind of, kind of got the vibe from like the roll and print and cut stuff, you know, it was just basically, I feel like you're wearing a sticker on a shirt and I got my first transfer and, and I was like, oh, this is going to change everything. So the question I'd like to pose to Rum is what, what is, you know, what's the big deal about your process? I know now we're kind of, you know, I always call it hybrid digital process. Now I, I think it's smart to call it direct to film screen print. Um, hybrid it probably makes people are pri probably more related to that. But what is it? What's the big deal about your process that sets it apart from traditional direct to film, where they're using an inkjet printer and printing a e film? You're, you're going to force me to talk, huh? I thought I was going to force you to talk. I thought I was going to just sit here and just listen to you and Mike and get get the easy way out. Um, you know, uh, I think that from a technical standpoint, Mike is probably best suited at to answer those type of questions, but you know, what, what we're doing is what makes it a hybrid process is the fact that we're using a semi color digital press on the front end, right? An offset press, which gives us the ability to print a wider gamut of colors. Um, you know, we're printing CMYK plus orange and violet. And now we just recently can reduce silver into our process. It is allowing us to print metallic colors. There's 28 metallic colors that we just use at the DAVs um, as an option on all of our transfers. Now, once we print that digitally onto the PET film, it's like making an upside-down cake. We're going to reverse the sheet. We're going to add um, two layers of water, uh, water-based white ink. Um, that's what gives it the opacity, the brilliant colors. Um, also um, contributes to its durability. And then after that, depending upon what type of fabric the transfer is going to be applied to, we're going to add a special adhesive. This could be a powdered adhesive that is designed to go on natural fibers like cotton or polyester, or it could be a nylon powder adhesive designed to go on 
to specialty fabrics that are synthetics like nylon and 300D polyester. And then you also have, you know, some principal adhesives that are going to um, work really well with super stretchy garments or, um, you know, for headwear. Um, so really what we've done is he built, um, you know, a capable set of transfers that are um, like tools in a toolbox that any printer could grab out and use uh, depending upon what they're definitely. And um, the idea was to really just simplify it down so that anybody could get into the print game. And let's just say that you're a screen printer and you have a, a print shop uh, embroidery capability and you don't have enough capacity, um, you know, to take on these uh, lower um, quantity jobs or high color count jobs or specialty fabrics. Really what you could do is dip into your super color toolbox and pull out one of the transfer types and then go to work. And um, I think that the simplicity of the, of, the, of the business and the offering is really contributed uh, quite a bit to our success. There's no choice confusion in the sense of having a variety of different types of transfers. Um, you make super color and, um, and then you get to pick the version of super color you want based on the fabric you're going to decorate. We like to say we do the heavy lifting. Yeah. And, and, you know, and when, when I got into this business, I was introduced to screen printed heat transfers right from the jump. And just being in that screen room, the one thing that I would always think about is how do I get out of it? Yeah. I don't want to be in that screen room anymore. And with transfers, you know, you eliminate a lot of that pain point. And the more you can eliminate that pain point and, and put people in more productive positions to make you, your shop more money, um, you know, there's a strong argument to be made that that's probably the right move. Um, and that's kind of the way I look at it. You'd mentioned water-based. I didn't realize that you were using water-based ink as part of your chemistry under the underbasing versus plastisol. That's actually a really big deal. Mike, do you want to talk about why water-based is a better choice than plastisol, petroleum-based products? Um, we, um, when I started out printing transfers, we were printing plastisol transfers. And, um, one of the challenges with plastisol transfers is when you, press them, they're not fully cured. Right. And so the, the pressing part of the operation actually helps with the curing process of the plastisol. Now, if you press it too long, all the opacity dives out because the plastisol is still a little bit liquid and it dives on into your shirt. And so they're, they're quite tricky. They don't, the, the bleed blocking properties of plastisol isn't that, isn't, isn't that great. Um, so we started printing water-based transfers. Water-based is a little bit different because you take a water-based ink, you put a, a catalyst in it. And so it's fully cured before somebody presses it. Got it. And it's a, it's a very, very, very robust transfer because all the layers sort of join together with that, um, with that catalyst. And um, what it means is you can press it for a minute and it won't lose its color opacity. Um, you can go back and repress it if it hasn't stuck, you can, you can do whatever you want. You can post press it. Um, it's a, the, the sort of transfer that we make actually is a very old school transfer that people have been making for a long, long time. The, the tricky thing that we did was we added the digital to it. Right. And what Ron was talking about before that digital offset press, it's a, um, it's an HP Indigo and they're very expensive, but the, it's not toner. It's not like a photocopier. It's an actual ink press. So in that machine is ink. So all of our color is actually ink. And um, the one thing, the, I suppose the byproduct of the water base as well is it's a very eco-friendly transfer because all of the inks are water based. That's why we've got our Oecotech certification and we pass all of the other certifications and all the other bits and pieces. But um, yeah, it, it's basically around the opacity and it comes back down to if your white is the best that it can be which is why we hit it with two whites, then your color sitting on top of the white is going to pop off. It's exactly the same as screen printing. All screen printing plays solid inks are translucent. Um, and so the better underbase that you get on that shirt, the more colorful your print looks. And um, the transfers are exactly the same. It's a, it's a very similar process. Um, you know, it's interesting. 
mentioning the digital offset printer, when, when, for our viewers, one of the things I'm going to recommend, you know, go hit YouTube, look up HP Indigo, and there's a great YouTube video with kind of the mechanicals of how an Indigo printer, first of all, you're going to be shocked when you see how big they are. And the new generation is the size of a small bus. Um, also, the price tag is a little hefty um, on an Indigo, but when you see how it actually prints with basically drum rollers and it's creating, it's based using polymer, I believe, to create printing plates on the fly. So if you look at the drum, there's a there's an electrode at the top, which makes, the, it charges the roller with the images. Yeah. And then it runs past a, a bid where it picks up the ink for the color. So it might pick up the magenta and then it rolls around and then it transfers that off onto a blanket. And then the blanket transfers that off to um, our substrate. And then it goes around a cleaning roller, and so that that uh, the where the image was and where the inks come off, it gets cleaned, and then it comes back up, and then it gets another charge on it, and then it picks up the yellow. It's a it's a, it's a very interesting machine. Yeah, what's cool about them is you know you do small runs. You don't have like in traditional offset printing where they have to you know basically create plates for each color. And for the for the viewers, one of the things that it's kind of a key difference. With, with true DTF, they're using solvent-based inks and they're printing them through inkjet heads onto the PET film. And then they're printing the white last in reverse order. And the white's gotta be a little bit little bit wet, a little bit tacky, so that it, when it goes through the coating machine to put the hot melt adhesive powder on, it, it sticks. So you, you run into um, humidity issues. Is, you know, where, where do you see it makes sense for somebody to maybe look at you know investing in a directive film? Because I don't think they're gonna spend the million dollars on a production line for a digital offset printer and, a, and automated screen printing equipment. At least most folks won't. Do you know, it's a, it's, it's a tricky question, Craig, and um, I feel like I'm doing a lot of the talking today, so I, I, I should probably leave this one to run, but but ultimately, um, we, um, we're all makers, right? So when you start up a screen printing shop or an embroidery shop or whatever, you 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 you're predetermined you're predisposed to making, right? Because you're making stuff and you're selling it out. And um, one of the one of the things about the director film printers are is you need a couple of people to run them. You need somebody who's smart enough to run it, separate the artwork, do all the other bits and pieces, and then you need another person to run the machine. And they've got to be a little bit of a technician, right? They've got to be technically inclined because when it goes out and when they've got to change their head and when they've got to do other bits and pieces. But basically what you're doing is you, you, you're making, you're putting in another department in your company where you, you make it. And, um, one of the really, and, and I, I was a maker for a long, long, long time. And, um, one of the really interesting things for me is when Supercolor came along and I started buying Supercolor, I didn't have much interest in making anymore. Right. Because it was so much easier, right? You put an order in and then it shows up next day or the day after, you know, and, um, all those people that I had printing transfers in an embroidery works, I then stuck them in front of heat presses. And instead of trying to juggle a schedule where I was having to work out how to print stuff and do all of the other bits and pieces and all of that, I've now just got a guy who's ordering transfers. I've got some people right. that are pressing transfers. So it massively simplifies the business and it meant that I could chase timelines and other bits and pieces. Um, I'm not sure if that answered your question, but... It, it, it did. And you brought a really good... Point. Uh, I have a, a really good customer and a good friend of mine is on the webcast today, Mark Heiss, and he's been phenomenally successful. He's the one that told me about, quote, direct-to-film. He's been phenomenally successful with direct-to-film and his solvent inkjet printer, and he's an early adopter. He's one of the first people to get a printer in North America, and when he told me he was going to buy the printer, I, I told him he was a lunatic, and of course, he had to prove me wrong. But Mark is mechanical. Mark can get under the hood. He's changed print heads. He knows how to maintain the machine. Um, so all the technical stuff on the art prep and the rip and all the things that it really takes to be successful at DTF, he's made it work. And I, th I think a lot of people that have that kind of side to them can can be the maker, so to speak. But that's not most people. You know, most people, they'll tell you they're going to maintain their printers. I saw this with the DTG um, game, was in that for quite a while. And yeah, I'm going to maintain the printer, but they go on vacation for two weeks and they come back. And what do we do now? Well, you get new print heads and then you're replacing all the wet parts. And that's now part of your cost basis for your break even, you know? So that's, that's one of the things that I really appreciate about what you, what you've done with Supercolor is that, that flexibility, you know, I ordered transfers yesterday for the trade show. They'll be delivered on Friday. They'll be perfect. 
Um, my coworker, I assigned him to do the pressing because it's hot in Arizona. He's going to do the pressing in Vancouver, Washington. <laughs> and our trade show shirts are going to look great. And we're going to give out transfers at the GPX booth. And there's just like literally no hassle to it. Can you explain how that works, how you guys deal with the artwork when you get the, you know, garbage artwork in? Uh, how, how, how do you how do you deal with that? Whichever one of you wants to kind of take that question. I'll take this one. Um, so we call it Superflow. And Superflow um, is kind of like intersection where uh, pre-press meets um, customer service. And essentially what happens is, is that every artwork that comes in gets checked by our team on Superflow. And if we can optimize the artwork, then we're just going to go ahead and do it. Part of the optimization process involves us redrawing artwork for our customers. So if we get really bad artwork, but the DPI is good enough for us to redraw it, then we'll vectorize it, we'll remake the artwork. And we do that at no additional cost to our customers because, um, at the end of the day, um, our job is to reduce the friction in the business and take away the pain that shot might be experiencing. And the way that we go about doing that is by doing some of this heavy lifting for them, taking the friction out of ordering e transfers. So they can put their order in. If it's not perfect, that's fine. We'll take a look at the artwork. We'll make it as best as we can because ultimately that artwork is going to determine whether it ends up being the world's best heat transfer or not. Right. And so if we want it to be super color, then it has to go through super flow in order for it to end up being a super color transfer. And, um, and as we, as we widened up, I suppose, um, we were selling it to in the early days we could control because we were dealing with screen printers and screen printers in general, they understand about vector art, you know, right. But, um, so we, we, we just started redrawing things like Rum said, and, um, we started redrawing things because it meant that p people got a transfer and some of them used to ask us like, can you fix our art like you did last time? Right. And, um, yeah. they, they noticed it, but we don't have any, one of, one of the things about Supercolor, we don't, we don't have a, we don't have a gatekeeper piece of software that says your artwork's not good enough. Great point. And what we, what we want people to do is we want people to order and be confident that we're going to work with them so that they get the best result because that's one of the key parts of the Supercolor experience. Agreed. And you, it's a really good point you made about the Gatekeeper software, you know, having uploaded artwork and processed orders through some of the other vendors, I feel like the system was designed <coughs> to benefit them on the production side, not to benefit the end user on the ease of order entry and ordering process. And, you know, that makes a big, that's a big difference to me. Uh, you know, when I'm placing an order, I want a seamless, easy experience. I don't want to have to think too hard. One of the things that, that I wanted to ask you both is, you know, if you're if you're competing, at, you know, traditional screen printers are coming around to the technology because they've recognized, you know, they don't nobody wants to set up a eight color simulated process job for 48 pieces, so they're starting to use the technology too. But let's say you're a small local business, mom and pop or home based business, and you're trying to compete maybe in the athletic world, in the team sports world and you're competing against a screen printer, how does the, the DTF hybrid transfer, how do you compete with the screen printer using your transfers? What would be some advice that you'd give? I think, I think the decision really starts when you know what type of garment you're decorating. And I don't think it's necessarily screen printing versus e-transfer. I think the decision really comes down to choosing what's going to get the best outcome for the customer. Now, you know, in most cases, if you're doing numbers and you're doing names, then you're really going to have to lean into transfers. But right. the, other thing, the other thing is, is, you know, it's going to come down to the number of colors. It's going to come down to what you're customizing, the location that you're printing on. There's a number of factors that have to be considered in all of this actually think that it levels the playing field. I agree. Um, because what happens is transfers have all of a sudden made, made um, decorating so much more accessible. You know, you don't have to invest into heavy machinery, like you were saying, like an Indigo or, or, or even a DTF printer that might cost between 10 and 30 K. You just need to go buy a really good heat press. That's going to allow you to be versatile 
get a really good transfer that's going to be able to go on that fabric and then understand how to position yourself in the marketplace with the right value that you're offering to your customers at a price that they're willing to pay. And all of a sudden, you can be a competitive business no matter where you are in the world. Um, one of the things that, that I wanted to ask you about is pricing. I don't want to get into a deep discussion on pricing because I know it's, it's a tricky discussion. But the question I want to as, ask you is, do you, because in a big production run situation, you know, if somebody's got, you know, doing a color simulated process and they've got big old M&R automatics and they're cranking through, you know, large volume, their production costs are going to be pretty low on screen printing um, compared to a transfer. So how do you position a heat transfer um, in terms of the, the the cost per print versus screen printing? Uh, you know, my, my, my personal feeling on it is it's a premium decoration process better than screen printing. I, I've got, I've, I've, I've got, you know, some feelings about this. I think at first it comes down to, are we just talking about t-shirts here? Right. Because, because really, um, the true benefit of heat transfers is the versatility that it, it gives a shot. I mean, if we're talking about like duffel bags and backpacks, and caps and, um, soft shell garments and um you know leggings and all of that stuff well you'd be hard pressed to find a, a better way to decorate them than than using heat transfers Great. at that point it doesn't come down to price it comes down to the value that you're you're providing to the customer as a decorator in terms of giving them a fully finished customized product right now if we're talking about t-shirts well then yeah there's 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 um probably more to discuss here but it comes down to what the quality is. How many colors are you uh, are you freighting? If we're just talking about high volume, well, you know, high volume heat pressing is on its way, and there's a lot of technology that's around the phone <coughs> that's going to allow people to press faster. Maybe not as fast if you were doing a one four color on a on a automated screen print press, but certainly, you know. Uh, even with the the MEM four station press, you're able to press 240 shirts an hour. You know, there's some carousel presses that are larger than that where you can press even faster. So, you know, I think that time will tell. Um, you know, if how much how much um, printers are going to be able to save. But right now, you know, in most cases, I think that screen printing is is still going to be cheaper when it comes down to t-shirts. Well, you know, it's interesting. You said that I was, I was standing at your booth. You guys were exhibiting alongside, um, I think it was rock at the printing United show. And I was standing outside the booth where there was people hovering around, um, super color as you guys are pressing transfers for people. And I was talking to a friend of mine that's in the business of creating, he has a business for creating color separations for simulated process. And I asked him what he, if he, what he thought about this, you know, digital transfer thing, how it was going to affect screen printers. And he says, I, I don't really think it's going to have much influence on screen printers. You know, the, the, you, you know, he was talking about the quality and the cost per print and all that stuff. And I, and I looked at him and I said, listen, the reason that you do simulated process when you screen print photo, you know, photo realistic images is because that's the only way you can do it with screen print. That's, that's why you do it that way. I said, given the choice, the customer wants the real realistic print that can be done digitally. They will choose that every time. And I told him, the reason, here's the reason I know that is because we had the same design screen printed on the back of our shirts at a trade show that was a full color, eight color simulated process. And then Supercolor made transfers of the same design and you hold them up next to each other. There was zero comparison. And from wash durability, there's no comparison. I have both of those shirts and I've watched them both. And my screen printing one, you know, it's looking vintage already because it's, you know, it's cracking and there's... There's problems and it looks cool as a vintage weathered design, but my super color transfer looks like you know, it's never changed. This thing's been washed 30 times. It looks like new. It feels just like a plastisol screen print. It's got a, it's actually better because it's a lighter hand. I mean, it's, it's pretty remarkable. So I, you know, I'm, I would advocate to our viewers. It's like you can position the super color transfer as a better than screen print premium trade process. One of, one of, one of my customers in the early days is a guy in Melbourne named Lockwood. And um, Lachlan was the screen printer. Had two M and R carousels. He had a eighteen color gauntlet, and he had a um, 
a 14 color or a 12 color sportsman or something like that. And when we, when, when we went in there, he was growing, he was doing ASI type work. He was um contractor and he was quite resistant at the start in terms of he's like, oh, you know, I've, I, I know how you guys are making it. I know how you're doing that. I could just do it myself, all that. And I said, look, if you add transfers to your offering, it won't cannibalize your screen fronting. Right. And he's like, what do you mean? And I said, well, it, it just won't. Let's, let's have a look. Let's have a look at it in three months. And he was, he was nice enough for me to show me, we, we, we started working together a little bit more and all of that sort of thing. And he would show me what his numbers were looking like. And he became, it was really interesting. What, what Supercolor enabled him to do is he could say yes to any job that walked into his shop. Yeah. No kidding. And he also meant that he put the more efficient work on his screen printing gear. Yeah. And so he's now printing one, two, three colors, you know, like his, his mix changed because the super color filled out the bit where he didn't want to put it on his machines. Right. And so if somebody came in with, um, 20 hoodies with an eight color design on it, he'd super color. It. If they came in with a technical garment that wouldn't stick to his palettes, he'd super color it. And what ended up happening to Lachlan is he, I think he tripled in size over the next sort of two or three years. He's now got four automatics. He's got more people pressing super color. He actually put embroidery in as well um, because he realized that he needed to become sort of like a, I suppose, a complete decorator. Um, he's not a fan of embroidery. Um, screen printers who put in embroidery always have challenges with it. But um, what I, I suppose the, the message there is, right? Like, it's super colors a little bit like the Swiss army knife of things. And it, and it often doesn't come down to the cost because it is more spendy than it is. If you're printing on a cost per print unit on a screen printing machine, but that screen printing machine gets really expensive when it's not printing. Yeah, it does. Cause you've got three people hanging around. You've got a machine that's worth, you know, a couple of hundred thousand dollars standing around, you know, and, and a lot of the time, if your pre-press isn't on point and you're, you know, you're all of that and the more complex the jobs are, the longer it takes to set up all of these things that ever amortized into it. And so what ends up happening is yes, if you look at it on a cost basis, super color might be dearer, but if you look at it on an efficiency basis and what you can do with those screen printing machines, which is easier for your staff to deal with and it's, it's no context, you'll grow because when somebody walks in, you'll just say, yes, sorry, I, I, it's a really kind of relevant story and everywhere that we've every screen printer that we've gone and we've talked to and put screen printing and super color in i've seen exactly the same phenomenon um i'm so glad you brought that up because you talk about scaling you know you want to scale on screen printing you're gonna buy another automatic press right and if you want to scale in heat transfer you buy another heat press and you hire part-time laborer to come in and press when you have jobs but the, the scaling, I'm, I'm so glad you brought that up. So here's the last question I'm going to ask. I'm going to ask both of you the same question. I'll go with Mike first. What is the number one tip that you would get somebody, give somebody in succeeding with the DTF hybrid transfers with Supercolor? What would be the number one tip you'd give them? And Mike, Mike gets the first run and then Rum can think about his answer. You know, um, It's basically invest in pressing equipment. Um, and it doesn't matter what transfers you're doing, right? Like the, the, the quality of your press dictates the longevity of your, your, your transfer on the shirt. Um, it now gives you flexibility to do other things. But the other thing that we also know is that when people invest money in sort of like better machinery, they, they put a focus on it. And we know that if you put a focus on heat transfers, you're just starting to end up running a better shop. Right, no matter what you do. Um, and like Ron said, there's some, there's some gear coming out now, the four station press. I think um, there's some other presses that we know about that we might have had a hand in that are coming out that are pretty awesome. And if if you go that way, then it's just going to be easy for you to run a better shop. Ron, what's your number one tip? You know, um, I was thinking about what Mike was saying and, 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 you know, press capability is great and the ROI on it is fantastic. But, you know, for me, it comes down to a very, very basic recommendation, which is just do it. You know, just do it. Let go of your biases. Doesn't matter if you're a printer, you're first and foremost an entrepreneur. 
doesn't matter if you have a production mindset, try to find that sales mindset in terms of trying to solve problems for your customers. Because if you're willing to go there, you'll realize that key transfers are going to be dynamic in your business and they're going to help you grow. And whether you use Supercolor, we prefer you use Supercolor or you use another transfer, we just want the adoption of key transfers to continue to grow because then we know that we'll be able to help more people along the way. And so just get started today. Don't wait. And if you're not a Supercolor um, client yet and you want to go for it, as Ram says, um, if you go to supercolor.com, there's a little button that says get started. Click on that that button, sign up for an account. You'll get a sample kit. They do a really nice job at that. You can play around with some real samples. And um, there's also a little drop down in there. It says, where'd you hear about us? And if you guys select, I think it says um, Inksaw Printabo Graphics Flow um, in the drop down, make sure you select that because we're trying to make, you know, we're just trying to track where, you know, people are coming from. So uh, really, it's been a privilege having you both on. I am looking forward. We'll do this again sometime. Uh, I, lear I learned a ton. Hopefully our viewers learned a ton too. So thanks again for joining us on Decorator Academy with Mike and Rum from Supercolor. Thank you.